it's Dr. Golligly. I'm just going to take a couple minutes to explain my philosophy of doing minimal discectomies, removing just the free fragment of disc material as opposed to removing as much disc material as possible. And I think this is a really interesting area of minimally invasive spine surgery. So the first thing I'm going to do is share um, a case that occurred this afternoon and then a couple of observations. So this is a patient with an L5-S1 disc herniation. Her symptoms are on the left side. And here, as we zoom in on the left side, you can see the S1 nerve root right here being displaced by a broad-based disc fragment that you know appears to be separate from the disc material itself. Um, and she has a lot of S1 nerve root pain. Those were the disc fragments that I took out. Um, but here, what I want to explain here, which is a really critical um, part of understanding the pathophysiology and the reason why disc herniations hurt, is um, these are some slides that, um, that were shared at a recent University of California, San Francisco symposium on uh, minimally invasive surgery. And these are, this image on the right is a T1 MRI scan plus gadolinium uh, fat saturated image as opposed to a standard T2 image on the left. So on the T2 image here, the disc herniation looks like this big, broad, gray structure sitting in this case on the right side. But here, when you add gadolinium, which is a contrast agent that helps to um, show inflammatory tissue as bright white, what you can see is that the disc fragments themselves are two pretty small pieces right here, surrounded by all of this white inflammatory fluid that even crosses the midline. So this is a great MRI scan that sli slice that shows that not only is the disc herniation much bigger than it appears, but the fragments themselves are actually pretty small, and most of what's causing this compression and signal change on the MRI scan is all the surrounding white inflammatory fluid. This occurs also in the foramen as well. This is a T1 image here showing what looks to be a huge foraminal disc herniation. But when you add contrast, you can see that the majority of that is actually inflammation surrounding the nerve root, which is the little dot right here in the center on a parasagittal view. And then here, uh, basically in a situation that's completely analogous to the case we're doing this afternoon, here's a lateral recess disc extrusion seen on the T2 image, displacing the nerve root here. Um, and here we can see that that's really a kind of central um, fragment surrounded by, again, another bright white signal of inflammatory fluid. So that's the reason why I choose just to do a minimal discectomy, because I think what's causing the patient's pain here is a combination of compression caused by this fragment of disc material, but more importantly, inflammation, as shown by the gadolinium images. So this case here is an L5-S1 interlaminar endoscopic approach. Um, so the first x-ray that I get is I've made a small little incision about big enough to accommodate something the size of a number two pencil, and I dock my central cannula on the interlaminar window, which is the space between L5 and S1. And then I'll get a lateral x-ray after the um, endoscope is completely docked on the L5 S1 disc to make sure that we're operating on the correct level. And these are the intraoperative findings here. And then we're going to come back to this image right here. So let's bring up the intraoperative images now. So this is the very first view that I get. Um, I started the camera just a couple of seconds after I started making snips in the ligamentum flavum. So the yellow area that you see here is the ligamentum flavum, surrounded by um, the, the metal is the tube that I'm operating uh, through, which is about the size of a number two pencil. So I'm just going to play this video and narrate it. So I've made a couple of snips into the uh, ligamentum flavum with my microscopic scissors um, so that the spinal canal is starting to come into view. And throughout this case, what you'll see is little fragments of material I have to kind of suction out through this little tube that I'm working in. Um, just for reference, the lat lateral is over here at the bottom of the screen, medial is at the top of the screen, the patient's head is over to the left, and the feet are to the right. So there you can see pulsatile epidural fat inside the spinal canal. And after making my um, opening into the ligamentum flavum and tidying up the edges, you can now see that I've advanced the cannula just a tiny little bit, and you can see the S1 nerve root coming into view just inside the lateral recess. So as we advance this a little bit further and clean up the edges with a bipolar uh, cautery device, the next thing we'll do here is we'll advance the cannula just a little bit further, exposing the S1 nerve root right there, that kind of white tubular structure running from about 11 o'clock down to 5 o'clock, 
and then the lateral recess just down to the side here. So this is my tool called a freer elevator. And I put this in and I use this to start mobilizing the nerve root off of the disc herniation. And what's important here is that initially the nerve root is pretty stuck down. We don't see any pulsatile movement in the, in the nerve root, which I think is important because normally nerve roots do need to move a little bit. And the white that you see coming into view there underneath is the actual disc herniation itself. So I take a couple of passes with the freer elevator to make sure that the nerve root is starting to get freely mobilized up off the disc herniation, which is where it's stuck. You can see pulsatile um, movement in the, uh, in the epidural fat, but not in the nerve root itself. And then I use my shrinker here to, um, to coagulate the vessel so they don't get any bleeding. I do this entire operation with basically less than about a cc of blood loss. And after a couple of passes with the cautery device, we're starting to see the disc herniation come into view nicely. And once that nerve root is nice and free, we can turn the cannula slightly in order to keep the nerve root out of the way and keep it protected, exposing just the disc material. So once we get to that view there, that's a pretty nice view there of the um, herniated portion of the disc here in the central portion of the cannula, the nerve root displaced up out of the way, held out of the way by the cannula um, more medially. And at this point, we usually pause and get a lateral x-ray to make sure that we're operating on the correct level. So we're going to come back here once we put the microscopic scissors in. This is the pause here while we confirm we're operating on the correct level. It takes a couple of minutes for my x-ray tech to come in and get her picture. Um, and then I just use a, a bolt up nerve hook just to make sure that the nerve root is completely free and that I, there's no chance that I'm going to um, grab it with the um, pituitary uh, rongeurs while I'm in the process of doing a discectomy. And once I know that that nerve root is now freely mobile and I've got my disc herniation securely visualized, the next thing I'll do is I'll come in here with a pair of microscopic um, scissors and snip the edge of the annulus. So the thing that I'm biting through here is the annulus fibrosis. And as soon as I bite through it, you can see that there's a subligamentous fragment of disc material that's ready to herniate out from just underneath the nerve root. And that's what I think is causing the majority of her physical compression and also chemical irritation, because that chunk of disc material causes an intense chemical reaction inside the annulus, which causes inflammation in the nerve root and sciatica and pain going down the leg. So you'll see that this piece is kind of tethered in there. Um, from a texture perspective, I kind of liken it to crab meat. It's got kind of a, um, a, a brittle sort of texture to it sometimes. Sometimes it's a little bit squishy. But that's the first major dominant fragment that comes out. Um, and in this case, there happen to be three large fragments in the, in the, um, in the subligamentous space plus, um, plus another of, uh, number of kind of accessory fragments. So once I've got those first chunks of disc material out, the, the nerve root is now starting to be decompressed, and the rest of the disc, which is down deeper inside here, is still pretty healthy and functioning just fine as a, um, as a shock absorber and as a joint in between L5 and S1. So I uh, continue to progress with my pituitary rongeur without entering the actual disc itself, because we'll see here a demonstration of where these disc herniations, when they when they occur, many times they become kind of encapsulated um, by annular fibers. So I wiggle back and forth with my um, with my cannula a couple of times just to make sure that I've got this thing really well visualized. And here, here's an advantage of what I have through the endoscope as opposed to the microscope. Deep at the bottom of this cavity, which is where the disc herniation came out of, you can still see intact annular fibers underneath there. Um, and if you go through those fibers, then you expose, I think you actually expose the patient to further risk of herniation in the future. And there I zoom in in order to show the kind of the cavity where the actual uh, herniated portion of the disc was sitting interwoven in the fibers of the annulus, which is why oftentimes these people have uh, bright white signal seen in the annulus itself. So I take a couple more bites in there just to make sure that there's no more loose fragments, which there aren't. And then um, tidy everything up with the um, with the shrinker device in order to kind of seal the, the collagen fibers. Make sure that there's no bleeding around the nerve root. You get a nice clean uh, area where we've done the discectomy. Just 
just take a couple minutes there just to kind of clean everything up. And then this is the picture that we like to see at the end. So we're just going to pause here. So now is, this is the S1 nerve root clearly in view here. Epidural fat is the yellow glisteny stuff. You can see kind of what I consider inflammation along the nerve root from the previous, um, from the previous uh, disc herniation. And you can see where the fragment of disc material is sitting just underneath the nerve root once we've turned the cannula back around to allow the nerve root to, um, to go back to its natural location. And you can see how now the nerve root is pulsatile, whereas previously it wasn't. Previously it didn't move with, with heart rate, and now it does, indicating that a lot of the adhesions on the undersurface of the nerve root have been freed up. So that's the area where I took the disc herniation out. Now you can start to see epidural fat starting to kind of cre uh, creep back in there. And I think that getting that barrier of epidural fat um, back in place is, um, is probably one of the things the body does to really decrease the inflammation in the nerve root. Um, suck the last little bit of kind of fragments out. Um, and then that kind of pulls the epidural fat back into position. And then as we back back out here from the cannula, you can see the tissues just kind of close around themselves naturally. And again, this entire thing is just done with, um, with a scope the size of a number two pencil. So this is the picture of the scope that I was operating through, which is the Richard Wolf interlaminar scope. Those are the three major fragments that I got out, which um, measure, you know, almost two centimeters by half centimeter um, in, in size. So really successful, uh, minimally invasive discectomy. And that's kind of my rationale for why I do just a, just a fragmentectomy, just trying to get the actual herniated fragment of the disc out. Because many times it's contained. I think it's surrounded by an area of inflammation that makes it bigger than it normally, bigger than it, than it, I think it makes it feel bigger than it oftentimes is on MRI scan. And I think that the components of sciatica are twofold. I think they're compression by the disc herniation itself, and then the inflammation that surrounds the herniation that makes the herniation um, uh, physically larger. So by removing just the free fragment and doing that in an endoscopic environment where there's saline irrigating that space, I think I also clean out the inflammation doing that the same way. Um, so that's my rationale for, uh, for free fragmentectomy as opposed to what's called subtotal discectomy, where um, oftentimes you'd go in and reach in and grab as many of the fragments of normal disc tissue out as possible. And I think you want those. You just want the free fragment, um, uh, you want uh, as much of the natural disc preserved as possible, and you want just the portion that's causing sciatic and inflammation gone. And I realize that's a little bit of a guessing game and a bit of an art form, but I feel like doing these through the endoscope has given me new insight in being able to identify tethering and adhesions on the nerve root, um, and also uh, really have a better sense of when the disc herniation is encapsulated in a, in a space inside the annulus and gives me a little bit of a bit better of a stopping point. So um, thanks a lot, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll share another case again in the future.